uh, because this book is really, really, it's amazing. It's not amazing only for the forest. It is amazing for politics in general. And I was with, uh, some weeks ago, with, not with, but uh, I had to discuss with some populist, European populist, who said, oh, we will be better without this Europe. We will be better in our country, refusing the other country, refusing cooperation. And I said, you have to read this book. And he said, why are you coming with a book about forests? And I said, it's just simple. In this book, you said, alone, we are nothing. And it's better to cooperate. So it's not only for forests, for trees. I think it's important for us. Our way to work as human is to cooperate, not to reject people, not to exclude people, but to work with people, being stronger, but also being weaker, being uh, the same, but also being different, be tall, but also being uh, less. <laughs> uh, so I think it's really a lesson of humanity that we are learning in your book. So thank you for, for this book. I will have some questions, of course, uh, to Peter. Uh, perhaps also to give him the floor, but I think it's important to, uh, to introduce. And if you can introduce yourself, and how does it come that you, as forester, it's like this, you decided to write this book. So perhaps tell us about your story. Okay, uh, my story is um, that I, uh, when I was six, year old, six years old, I wanted to, be, uh, to become a conservationist. Um, and um, after school I studied forestry because I thought a forester would be something like a tree keeper. It turns, uh, turned out then that it, that was a mistake. And um, uh, because, they say in harsh words, a forester is a tree keeper. Um, yeah, it is a timber producer. And uh, then I changed the, the way of forestry. Um, and um, I made guided tours through, through my forest uh, since uh, 30 years. And the people were always asking where to read more about. And uh, I said, mm, I don't know, there isn't, there isn't any book. But, um, the, the interesting fact is that I, when, when I make guided tours, I don't tell the people, ah, this is a beech tree, and this is an oak tree, and you can differ between the different species. That's boring. And uh, no, I, I'm telling about the latest research, and um, the latest research is really yeah, it sounds a little crazy that trees are cooperating. The trees, for example, can feel pain. That's the latest research, for example, from the University of Bonn, which is not an esoteric uh, institute, as you know. Uh, uh, just, just to say, trees can uh, even produce pain-suppressing substances. That means that they can reflect pain. And uh, that was a recent um, article by a journalist in the New York Times. And then I uh, went to the university because I had to talk to this professor in person. But I'm uh, coming up from my way, but that's typical for foresters. <laughs> uh, no, my, the, the people were always asking where to read more about, and then my wife said, uh, please, Peter, write, write down something so that I, that I can hand out something to the people. And I refused for 10 years. Because I said, no, I don't like to write. Uh, <laughs> but love is a strange thing, and uh, after 10 years, I gave up my resistance and uh, wrote, wrote this <coughs> scripture, and yeah, here I am. Why do you think it's a bestseller? Because it's really strange to speak about these um, trees and think that they are, they are feeling pain. And how does it come that it is now a bestseller? Um, I think it's a little bit like making a forecast for yesterday, a weather forecast, <laughs> because no one really knows how to make a bestseller. But uh, uh, I think it's it's time uh, people are uh, have enough from from um, just just being told about economical things uh, concerning forests. Uh, when you think about a forest, uh, first most people think about the production of oxygen, the production of uh, healthy water, the production of timber. But if you could I'm not able to, but if you could ask trees, they would say, huh, we are doing what? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's not, it, yeah, we, we regard the trees as our servants. And that's something uh, that we do uh, since the age of enlightenment. That's a cultural, uh, historical phenomena. Uh, that, we, that we all, uh, our surrounding creatures regard as servants. And uh, I think um, we are now 
on, on a point uh, where we, when we see climate change, when we see, see those environmental destructions, that people say there's more worth in the forest than, than just raw material. And uh, perhaps it's this empathic view of on uh, trees uh, where the people were in need of, and perhaps it was the right, the right time to write such a book. Do you think there is an opposition between how to protect forests and these trees and the productivist uh, model that we are in for the moment? And how do you see the future for these forests? Yeah, see, uh, I think uh, our economic uh, model um, is, is a copy of uh, which we thought is evolution. Um, we all learned in school that evol evolution means the survival of the fittest, but we uh, interpret it in a way that we say survival of the strongest, and that's wrong. That's not meant by this term. term. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and by this we regarded nature as a big battle, that every single species compete against uh, each other, so, uh, in, in reality, it turned out that, that nature is cooperation. It's, it's completely different. It's cooperation. It's like you said, in the European Union, it's, it's like all the world organizations, um, which we see now in, in some parts fell apart. Um, and uh, so, so, so nature uh, has nothing to do with our economy system. What we, what we try to bring over nature is, yeah, we, we interpret it as, as a special way of capitalism, but, but nature is cooperation, it's completely different, and that's much more relaxing. Uh, tre uh, treating nature like this, viewing nature like this, um, and I think it's, it's time to, to bring nature back this, uh, this piece. You know that um, it's not only in Belgium, but we have here in Belgium this uh, March for Climate, and there are very young people being every week more than three, more than uh, 30,000 people being on the street for the climate. Uh, what is your message to these young people for the moment when, when you deal with these forest issues, but in the climate in general? My message uh, is very short. Keep on. <laughs> because uh, Germany, we are now uh, talking about if it is uh, okay to make demonstrations on Friday because couldn't they be on sun, sun, Saturday, for example? It's crazy. On Saturday, they, they wouldn't have... Uh, this, this uh, public view. So uh, I, I only can say, yeah, you're completely right. Why learning for something that we are destroying? We, we and I, I, I just uh, talking about those old guys like me. Uh, we are destroying this planet and teaching our, our children how to do it the best. And they say, no, you're crazy. That you're on the on the wrong way. We should should correct it. You say that you are the experts, so you should be able to do so. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do, although I know that I'm not perfect enough. So, so I beg all, all those school kids, keep on and push uh, us old guys on the way, on the right way. So, we were just discussing before, and we said that democracy is not just going to vote for one day, yeah. uh, but it's also a question of education. So you wrote this book, is a kind of education, but how can we work with uh, civil society and how is it possible to pass these messages to the civil society? Because we as politics, we need to have this support. So how is it possible to work together on this? First, uh, I, I, I want to leave, leave, leave it to you because there's this wonderful forest pledge which I like to mention, which has just to be signed afterwards. Uh, just be done, <laughs> and uh, but for for the lay people, for all the people uh, which are just thinking that that uh, democracy is to make a cross every four or five years, uh, I would like to encourage them. I do so at my nature academy to care for their local forest. The most more, or many forests in Germany, most forests are on public land, and so they belong to the people. If you don't agree uh, with uh, uh, how a government is, is dealing and managing those forests. Uh, then you sh should protest, bring it to the newspapers, care for your forest, and there, there are a lot of efforts going on which can be seen in, in, the, cha in the change of strategy of the Forest Commissioner. They, in the moment, in the first step, they change their wording. They say, oh, we are, we are all good guys, we, are, we, we offer forest bathing, for example. No, no, we don't make any clear cuts, although this, that isn't true. So there is a change and a little fear uh, coming up amongst the forest industry to change. Just to say it again, uh, I'm not against forestry. I'm myself still a forester. I'm writing books, of course, and they are on paper. Um, so I love timber products, but not in a way that we destroy forests. That's not necessary. They are, they are intelligent methods 
where you can have better interest from the forest, bigger interest, more jobs. That's always an argument. Uh, if you protect forests, you, you will destroy jobs. No, who told you that? You, you create jobs with that. And you get better timber, better timber quality. Uh, so so the, the methods are there, they are, have just to be used. I think, I don't know if we have time to get to, to give the floor to the public uh, that is here. So if you have some questions, um, if you want to say something, uh, yeah, I will give you answer yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Willy de Bakker. I uh, have been working here in this parliament for the Greens actually about 30 years ago. Afterwards I set up uh, Iraktiv, which probably most of you know, the, uh, the press uh, media in, in, in Brussels. Um, as I've been working, and uh, Heidi knows that, Heidi Hautala, with whom I work, I've been working for 30 years in green politics. And when I read your book, and let's say, at the same time reading Richard Powers, The Overstory, I was shocked, because I understood that I had actually understood nothing about green politics. It's only after having read those two books that really my eyes opened and said, whoa, this is a lot broader than what I have thought of now. So I think this initiative is absolutely great. But as I'm also having been a journalist, I have a question for you, uh, and maybe for the organizers. How many MEPs or future MEPs have already signed, I hope a lot, uh, this, this, this pledge? And if not, uh, what can you do to make sure that this is signed and what will happen afterwards? Because before the elections, I know how it is, there's a lot of pledges, but afterwards everybody has forgotten about them. So if you could tell me what you intend to do to make sure that this becomes a success. Thank you. Yeah. I would answer really rapidly. We have this cross-party initiative, and I think it's important to have a cross-party initiative because um, convincing between the one who are convinced is something, but we have to convince more uh, in this European Parliament. And it is why we are working with uh, SND, Greens, GUE, uh, EPP. We hope that we will have uh, some people coming from ALDE also. And so it's important to have this cross party initiative. After we have to work in the different committees, uh, it's what I said, in the INTA committee. We think that it's important to have, for example, in the trade agreement, a sustainable chapter that is really uh, mandatory with sanctions. Because if you do trade without having uh, respectful standards and sanctions to companies that are not respecting them, it's no use. So we have also to convince this changing uh, uh, mentality about how we do trade uh, all over the world. So it is the way we are doing it. We have more and more people thinking like us. We have no majority for the moment on this. We have to say that. And we hope that after the election of 2019, this election, we will have, we hope, more people uh, thinking about climate change, about forests, about environment, and about the way we are living now for the moment in the humanity. Uh, so I think that we have to continue to convince people. And I, I heard that you were in politics since 30 years. Yeah, 30 years. Um, uh, we, 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 we are there to continue this work, your work, and to continue this work for the future. So I hope that we will reach a majority in this uh, parliament as soon as possible on this. And I just uh, want to say that uh, my part, I think, is to encourage people to support you. It's not just, when you, for example, when you sign it, uh, then you're just one person, uh, of course, on an important place. But without support of the people uh, in between the, the um, legislation period, I think it's, it's harder. And people, in the moment, many people think you should struggle. But they should struggle too for for the forest, and that's that's your part. Is is in parliament. My part is on on the street or in the forest for the people. And so I think together that's exactly how it works. And a uh, very important message also from the book, but what forest can teach us to be patient, also with ourselves. Uh, a small step is better than, than no step, and, and, and what is even more important, the direction. And as, as as long as we move in the right direction, we should be patient uh, because forests are are very, very slow beings, uh, very slow systems, 
uh, they also they also don't have uh, very very uh, fast um, developments. And uh, when we try to do, to change th things fast, then many people get disappointed because it doesn't work. That's that's the the, the only big uh, negative thing on democracy that it is very slow. But uh, I love democracy, and therefore uh, I appreciate every single slow step. If I, if I may add something on this, yeah. for example on trade, at the beginning of this legislature, uh, um, the, commission, the, the Commissioner Malmström said that she was for ISDS, you know, this uh, tribunal, private tribunal for investors. These private tribunals are against people, and they are against people fighting for their rights, and also environmental rights. And so, for example, when we are dealing with trade in Colombia, and if you have a mining sector destroying the forest, uh, they can use this ICS against the, against the country. And in five years, we succeeded in putting it outside the trade agreements. And so it was not easy. It was really a strong battle that we have had here with the civil society. And I thank, really uh, thank you, the civil society, with, for the, for the work you have done. But with the civil society, we succeeded in saying to the commission, you don't have to have this power in the end of the investors against the people. And so it's something that we can, we can say, OK, it's possible to change something. And it's perhaps not enough. Um, it, it is perhaps too slow. But I think that we have to take it for, for, as a victory. I don't know if there are other questions. The microphone is over there. Yeah. No? No? Yeah. 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 Hi, um, I'm Arlette from Jans. I'm a very small shrimp. I started a uh, reforestation in Belgium, Flanders, six years ago because I love trees. I've been like, I was 11, yes. but I started uh, to appreciate plants, and that grew, and that finalized loving trees. I got uh, your book three years ago. Uh, well, actually, my husband got the book from his uh, father, because my uh, husband is also uh, adoring trees. And only now I started reading it, after three years because I'm too busy with reforestation, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my father-in-law uh, father died a month ago, and I started reading your book because I was looking for answers. And I thought, I'm not going to bother you with maybe answers that you already have written down. I, I respect your time. <laughs> um, but I, I wrote, uh, I, uh, I saw that actually uh, planting trees is planting like, um, um, yeah, it's not, yeah, uh, I, I don't uh, find the word. Uh, 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 an orphan. An orphan. Actually planting trees, I now understand that I'm planting orphans. And so I'm asking you, is it really good what I'm doing? Because it doesn't feel like good anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there are different answers. There's never just black and white. Um, uh, in general, when you want to uh, bring nature back, you have to do nothing on the, those spots because after just 500 years, you have a pri primary forest back. Uh, but that, for us, we are impatient. We love to have uh, fast results. And uh, therefore, it's okay to plant the first generation of trees, but uh, within this plan should be that the next generation could, could grow under the, the tree parents, under the mother trees. Because planted trees are never as stable as, as uh, trees grown out of seeds. Now, for example, you have always a weakened uh, root system which roots flat. There is no tree species which root flat, roots flat, but every tree you plant will root flat and will easily be thrown in a, in a thunderstorm, for example, or, or a winter storm. So, um, in this case, it's, it's also for us to plant trees because we have fast results. It's also good for the environment, of course, but the best way would be uh, to, to bring uh, a new forest by themselves. 
and so uh, just keep in mind that this is just the first generation and behind that there will be the wild and uh, natural generation of trees. I must say that I've already started to alter my project. <laughs> <laughs> I'm focusing now on getting the mentality within a large group of people and uh, letting them see that actually what I'm doing was a lot of fun and is still a lot of fun. And if it's possible for me as a little shrimp, it's possible for many, many other people. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Piotr Borkowski. I do represent the State Forest Association here in Brussels. I am a forester, although I do not consider myself to be a woodcutter. Uh, I wanted to ask you um, a question uh, because you mentioned that especially we should not allow the governments to exploit or to use forests because the forest belongs to people. But at the same time, uh, what's your uh, advice how the whole forestry system, even if we refer only to the asset which is in the, in the hands of the governments of the states, should be maintained because it's a kind of on the edge between um, ecosystem which is biotope and then economic closer to the market. It, it embraces all these elements and then of course forest does not grow on itself and you know this as a forester. Somebody has to take the, uh, the care of forest, whatever this care means. It means people, infrastructure, and then especially when we are in a situation like in not all the governments are able to pay for maintain, maintaining or taking care about the forest using the public funding, what should be the, the solution in your uh, opinion? And then one more, sorry for that, you mentioned also that uh, the exploitation is, is, is not good. The best, at least in my view, is always to give the example. Uh, can you give uh, any examples of mismanagement of the especially state forests in Germany? Uh, yeah, I can give you a 100% uh, uh, statement of mismanagement. In Germany, we, have, we have, haven't one single square meter left of primeval forest. That's mismanagement. Uh, because every single square meter has been managed in a way that we don't have old forests. For example, Germany was once a land of uh, beach, old beach forests. And the oldest beach forest we have in Germany uh, contains trees older than 180 years. That's nothing because beach trees can be as old as, as we don't know exactly, perhaps 500 years or so. And those forests with young beach trees older than 100, 180 years, we just have uh, around about 3 per mil left. That's almost nothing. There, this is exactly the ecosystem which the German government is responsible for. That's mismanagement. We have in Germany, we have more than 50% conifer plantation. And in Germany, <coughs> forests are say, hey, that's a forest. No, we don't have forests in Germany. We have visitors from other countries, for example, the, the forest chief from Iran. And Iran has the last big primeval beach forest left. Around about, it differs how do you determine them, around about 5,000 square kilometers. And he visited us, and he was a German forest, Austrian forest, Swiss forest, and he said, why don't you have real forests like we have? <laughs> and the next question, whatever, because I said, oh, okay, you can make it by money, uh, with the funds who protect forests by buying them and so on. Why do you, do, why do you always talk about money? He didn't, he didn't understand that. So uh, that's mismanagement. And um, Germany, by, by the highest court, it's forbidden for the State Forest Commission to look first after timber. And when you look, in Germany we have every 20 meter we have big ways for big machines which destroy the soil for thousands of years by compressing them. That means 60, a row of 60 meters for, for trees and then 4 meters for machines. 60 meters for trees, 4 meters for machines. And so far it's a state uh, forest research institute in Baden-Württemberg. They found out that meanwhile more than 50% of the forest soil shows um, uh, destruction by machines. And that's mismanagement. So I, I, I don't judge a single forester, because I, I'm still a forester, and foresters learn that that is um, uh, environmental friendly forestry, which it isn't. I say we should change the system, and it's a democratic process, and therefore I would like to involve the people and discuss how we should do it. But I'm, I'm completely with you. The foresters are under pressure. They should deliver timber. 
Yeah, and, the, and the people say, we want to have timber for, for books, for our house, or whatsoever. Uh, we want to have timber. On the other hand, we want to have nature. And that you can combine. And therefore, it's a process, democratic process. And what I would like to have a discussion, how many percentage of the woodlands should be under protection. Because otherwise, we could not longer discuss with countries like Brazil or Indonesia, because they have still uh, left some bright new forests, which we haven't. So we are the first to change our way of management. And what we do, for example, we uh, don't use big harvesters, we, we uh, work with woodworkers and with horses that works since 6,000 years very well and we have good interest for the, for the wood owners. And then many people say, oh, we don't have that many pulling horses. Yeah, because there's no demand. And that's a question of jobs. And uh, the first argument uh, against protected areas from forest commissions is we lose jobs. No, we create jobs by environmentally friendly forestry. We create jobs in national parks. But meanwhile, the biggest clear cuts in Germany are made by the Forest Commission in national parks. Yeah, for example, some month ago, in the national park of Hunsrück, uh, where I live, there's just allowed one hectare of clear cuts. And in, in the national park, there's a clear, fresh clear cut, uh, 130 hectare, 130 times bigger than allowed by law. And the definition is, Hey, that's not a clear cut. That's a development zone. So, huh? But it's a forest national park. So that's really crazy. Uh, and exactly those things we should change. And I think um, in Germany we're we're on a really on a real bad way. And that's exactly why I encourage people to take a closer look. Because when you lay people, you're not miseducated by saying, "Oh, I'm like God. I create forests." Forests are here on this planet since more than 300 million years. Mankind is here since 300,000 years, and forests are here since 300 years. So we have still a lot to learn. Trees may have not even recognized that, that uh, humans are on this planet. And uh, we have a lot to learn, but what I very often hear from foresters, we create forests, and without a forest will break down. I said, OK, uh, and what about the Amazon rainforest? Uh, who does, does the job there? So. I'm myself critical because I'm a forest and I've done things like that myself. And I feel sorry for what I've done 30 years ago. And therefore, I changed it. And I need the help of the people, so I educate them to fight for their rights and their forests. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you said that you feel sorry, uh, but I think that we have to feel sorry all together. But we also have to give good messages for the future and change the things. So I think we are all whistleblower for forests. Uh, so I think it's necessary to do our job uh, as politic, as civil society, as citizenship, uh, as citizen. I think it's necessary to, to do this. So thank you for being here. Uh, and I will let the floor to the panel. Uh, Sirpa is going to... Yeah, she's there. She's just there. So thank you very much. We will have the next panel. Thank you. Thank you.